GMC, for those of you who aren't familiar, are the founders and maintainers of the Long Trail. I have to read the mission because it's, it's so good, I'll mess it up otherwise. Uh, we make the Mount, Vermont Mountains play a larger part in the life of the people by protecting and maintaining the Long Trail system and fostering through education the stewardship of Vermont's hiking trails and mountains. And I really can't think of a better way to do that at a time like this than just hanging out with a bunch of people who love spending time outside and in Vermont, Vermont's mountains. Um, before we jump in though, I'm gonna have uh, Lauren walk us through how a Zoom webinar is actually gonna work tonight. Awesome, thank you so much, John, and thanks all you out there for joining. Um, you wouldn't think it, but the Green Mountain Club as a trail building organization, uh, we're pretty good at running webinars, it turns out too. So, um, so I can help you uh, get situated out there. So the way that this works is that we essentially have John and myself and the rest of our fabulous Long Trail End to Enders who are what we'd call panelists. And then you folks all out there sitting in the comfort of your homes are the attendees. Um, you don't have the capability of video or audio. We keep that off for the ease of transmitting information and just not managing 80 different participants. Um, but you do have a lot of other capabilities. Those are uh, found, I think, on the bottom of your screen or the top left of your screen. And that would be the chat box and the question and answer box. Um, so if you have a comment or something that you'd like us to know um, or say that somebody else on the panel is used your favorite backpack and you have that as well, you can add that into the chat box. Um, if you have a specific question or something that you'd like to know, then the question and answer box is really good for that. It forms a thread and everybody can enter into that and we'll monitor the question and answer box throughout the night. Um, so if there's something that goes in, then John or myself will be able to take that question. We can pose it to all the panelists or we can just answer it right away there. Um, so those are really the two important things are the, um, the chat box and the question and answer box. Um, there's also a feature called raise hand. If you do that, then, um, We'll probably send you a, a quick chat and ask what's up or um, or we'll encourage you to post into the Q&A box. For the ease of things, then we're going to keep the audience muted um, for the majority of the panel. So those are the two. If you have issues, if there seems to be a problem, then please uh, state that in the chat box um, and we'll do our best to, to mitigate any technology challenges. Um, and as always, um, while I said we're getting pretty good at it, I would rather be in a room with all of you at the same time. So just have patience um, and flexibility as we go through these things. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah. Um, so for the end to end panel, the way it's gonna go tonight is we're gonna have the panelists introduce themselves and then we'll run through a series of questions that we prepared based on interest from the attendees. Um, some of the big topic groups that we have picked for tonight are resupplying and gear, obviously, uh, food, storage, and wildlife, shelters and tenting, transportation and logistics, and any hazards you might run into out there. Um, so throughout the panel, feel free to submit questions, like Lauren said, um, through the chat or Q&A. And you'll also be getting a couple polls throughout the night so we can hear from you as well uh, about specific things. And um, we'll do our best to answer all your questions um, as we can. Um, I know we're all thinking uh, this year what hiking is, is gonna look like. Uh, it's a little uncertain at the moment, but um, in order to address those concerns right off the bat so we can spend the rest of the night thinking about um, the good times we'll have out there. Um, I've asked uh, Mike DeBonis, the GMC's executive director, to join us and spend a few minutes talking about what our response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been. So, Mike. Thanks, John. I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah, I have to be honest, when I first got the email from John about the end dinner panel, I was like really excited. I was like, wow, I, I get to be on and ender panel and it's kind of a big deal and I was pretty psyched about it. Then I read the email and no, he, he just wants me to come on and talk about COVID-19. So apparently I'm not 
not ready for the panel, but, but maybe, maybe in a future year. So COVID-19. <laughs> so in a normal year, club staff and volunteers will be preparing trails for the upcoming hiking season. Hikers will be getting ready to start their through hikes after mud season. But we all know this is not a normal year. The COVID-19 global pandemic that's impacted all of us has also impacted the long trail. So I just want to take a couple minutes tonight, as John said, talk a little bit about basically the best information that we have on trail closures, conditions, hiker services, and then what through hikers can expect this year. So specifically related, related to COVID-19 and trails, due to the highly contagious nature of COVID-19, the difficulty of maintaining adequate social distancing on many sections of the trail, and the possibility of the virus staying on frequently used surfaces like shelters, privies, and picnic tables, the Green Mountain Club is asking hikers to avoid hiking on the Long Trail and Appalachian Trail for the time being. So what's open, what's closed? It's mud season in Vermont, and currently the Long Trail and side trails and backcountry facilities on state land are closed. Trails including the Long Trail and Appalachian Trail on land managed by the federal government, the Forest Service, Park Service are open, but backcountry facilities such as shelters and privies may not be available for use until June 15th. Typically, with mud season behind us, hiking trails across the state are open by Memorial Day weekend, and we expect that to be the case this year. Shelters and privies may be open by June 15th, based on guidance by public health experts and our land management partners. Please check the GMC website for the latest updates. So what can you find out there? What are the conditions? What's maintenance been? Based on the governor's order, GMC staff and volunteers have very limited capacity to conduct trail maintenance, and most trails, shelters, privies have not been prepared for hiker use. Overnight sites and summits may not be staffed or maintained this season. Hikers on the Long Trail and Appalachian Trail should expect unmaintained trails and trail-related facilities for the foreseeable future. So what happens in town? Again, based on the governor's order, hiker services in Vermont may not be available or may look a little different. Shuttles, hostels, gear shops, restaurants, medical facilities and grocery stores normally available to hikers may be closed or operating at a limited capacity for the foreseeable future. The Green Mountain Club Gamaroff Hiker Center, Waterbury Center is physically closed, but the hiker center is available to answer questions and provide information virtually through an email and the online store is open. So again, please visit the GMC website or contact the Hiker Center for the latest information on what's happening, what's open, what's closed. So the big question, when are things going to open back up and when can I start my through hike? Some trails and trail related structures and services will open as normal by Memorial Day weekend, but others may not open fully or operate in a different way for the time being. As the risk from the pandemic decreases, trails and trail related services will resume based on guidance from state health officials. This guidance is still being developed now, and we will share this with the hiking public as soon as it's able, as soon as we're able. Once trails open, hikers should expect public health and social distancing precautions to remain. New guidance for protecting public health at parking areas, shelters, and overnight sites and privies may be implemented and impact the use and availability of these services and facilities. Now there's no doubt that the 2020 hiking season is going to look a little different than past years due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Hiking along trails is a privilege and it's a life-changing experience for many. The trail is going to be there and hikers should consider whether they need to through hike this year or whether plans can be postponed until fall 2020 or the 2021 hiking season. If you hit the trail this year, expect some level of trail and trail related facilities to be available this summer and fall, but availability may be limited to protect public health and trail resources. I think the biggest way, the biggest takeaway from this update is that through hikers should approach trip planning this year with an open mind and flexibility. Now, the Green Mountain Club is in the business of promoting hiking in Vermont. We've been doing so for 110 years. Nobody wants to see people out enjoying the hiking trails more than we do, but we also want people to be safe and protect you, other trail users, and the trail resource itself. So please stay tuned for further guidance as we get into the hiking season and be safe out there. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, so 
we'll jump right into uh, introducing our panelists. Um, so I've given them all a few questions ahead of time that they can tell you about a little bit about themselves and, and their hike. Um, so uh, I see Talita, you're unmuted. Why don't we start with you? Yeah, so uh, my name is Talita. My trail name was Wolf Mama. And that's because I threw hiked the long trail with my dog here, Nala. Um, we threw hiked last summer. We went Novo and we completed the whole trail in 36 days. Um, what I can offer to the panel tonight is that I did hike with my dog. I solo hiked as a female. Um, I live in Mass, but I do call Curitiba, Brazil my home because that's where I was born and that's where most of my family lives. Um, and one thing that I wish I knew before my hike was that, you know, it is very crucial to plan everything. And I tried to plan everything to the last degree, but when it came down to it in the end, um, things change and plans change. So I feel like it's good to be prepared to know what's coming, but like all the planning I did and like, I, I just spent so much time and effort and in the end, like things change daily and I just had to be adaptable. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Talia. Uh, how about we have the Donalds go next? Great. Um, I'm Jesse Donovan, and I hiked the kids, uh, hiked the trail originally with three kids, and um, finished with two kids. We started on June twentieth, and it took us eighteen days. Um, my trail name was Medic, and this is um, Ava or Watch was my trail name. And uh, my name's Elliot. My child name was Maui. And it was pretty fun. They both had their birthdays out on the trail. So Ava turned 12 and or watch and Maui turned 12 and 15. Um, and we are from Vermont. So that made it easy as far as logistics because my husband was able to support us every four or five days and just resupply us. Um, Ava, what's one thing you wish you knew? Um, I wish I knew that like I didn't need a full set of backup clothes all the time because I carried like a full extra set of clothes the whole time but I didn't ever use it but um yeah and I guess I would say I wish I knew that my kids didn't need like four extra days of food just in case at all times because like I had always had this huge extra food bag um and Elliot uh I wish I had brought more socks wet most of the time so there you go. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, how about Niels next? Uh, hi, my name is Niels. Um, I threw hike the long trail uh, last year in July, late July, southbound. Um, it took me 18 days. My uh, trail name was Fritos because I always had a bag of Fritos with me. And I'm from Vermont. And I wish I knew. Um, how much it would rain on the trail. <laughs> Good one. And we'll finish up with Tom and Rockhopper. Hey, I'm Tom Kidder from West Newbury, Vermont. My trail name was Krumholz. Um, I threw hiked the trail in 2014 and then uh, hiked it again with my grandson section hiking it from 2016 to 2019. That's Rockhopper, who's going to introduce himself next. I live in West Newbury, Vermont. And I, I really thought very hard about what I wish I had known, and I, uh, I didn't have too many surprises. I, I was a little bit surprised that uh, so many college freshman classes were having their orientation on the, on the trail that uh, it would uh, sort of lock up the shelters a little, little bit. It was fine. It was a surprise to me, but it was easy to work with, and I rather enjoyed their company. So no, no surprises that were negative. <laughs> Great, Tom. Thanks. And Rockhopper? I'm Cyrus Kidder. Um, I section hiked it between 2016 to 2019. Uh, my trail name was Rockhopper. And something I wish I knew before I hiked the trail was that powdered milk, powdered milk does not taste good. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> well, thank you all. Um, and now that we've heard a little bit from our panelists, uh, we're curious to hear about uh, your all's experience 
Uh, so we're going to do a quick poll just to um, hear a little from the attendees and what you're interested in. All right. Thanks, John. I'll pop that poll up. Um, and so all you out there in the audience at home, um, you're going to see a thingy pop up on your screen. And we would love you to participate in the thing. Um, we can get to know a little bit about you. So here you go. Uh, and panelists, you should see that on your screen as well. Uh, feel free to, to add in. You've done that already, but the more the merrier. Um, and just to let you all know, somebody did ask a question. So as we get to going around and circling around, um, folks out there are interested in what time you hiked. So if there's a time of year that you were out particularly, uh, I think it, people generally like to know that. Oh, wow. We are getting answers flowing in. That's cool to watch it go. You can see that? Yeah. Yeah, it's really neat. Um, Tom, I I didn't know that your truck name was Crumholtz. That's a cool one. Thanks. <laughs> I've been what the Crumholtz is, the, the alpine zone where the trees grow about knee high and they're old and tough. <laughs> That's pretty well. My favorite part of the mountain. <laughs> Ooh, siesta. I like siestas. You get to take naps during siesta time. That's cool. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Dayton. Please, please accept my apology. We were limited on the amount that I could put in there. <laughs> I'm, I love Rhode Island and New Jersey. Great places. Um, all right, John, looks like we got most, yeah. most answers in there. Yeah, so yeah. I'll, uh, I'll end and I will share the results and let you take back over. Well, cool. thanks, Lauren. You're welcome. Um, yeah, it looks like we yeah, have a fair number of uh, experienced hikers out there, which is, which is great to see. People still interested in learning more. We like, we like to hear that. And uh, yeah, everyone loves food. And people are always curious about logistics. <clears throat> cool. Well, thank you all for responding. And a good amount of backpacking experience, too. That's, that's wonderful. Everybody's just trying to get their end into the long trail piece there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, panelists, here we go. First question. What inspired you to hike the long trail? We'll start with... Uh, Niels. Um, I, I'm a boy scout and when I was 11, my first merit badge was the hiking merit badge. And we hiked all of the 4,000 uh, foot peaks in Vermont. And ever since then, I wanted to do it. Great, thanks. Anyone else care to share? I can go. Um, so I hiked the long trail because I always had a dream to do like any long distance trail. I've had my eyes set on the AT for a while. Um, but I was like, can I really do that? Like, I don't know. It's kind of crazy. Like, can I carry everything on my back? So I kind of like when I started it, I kind of went into it thinking like, all right, let's see how far I can push this. Like, can I do this? But then a week later I was like, all right, I'm in it for the win. Like, <laughs> till the end. That's great. Thanks. Um, I, we, I was inspired to hike the long trail. I really became kind of obsessed with the idea of like going for the fastest known time, seeing how fast I could do it. And then um, I thought, well, what about the family fastest known time? So we would joke that <laughs> when we were when we were out there. It was more of an adventure with the kids. So what inspired you? Um, well, my parents hiked the Appalachian Trail together, like after college, I think. And I thought it was really cool. And I found like their old journals like that they wrote in every day. And I like read them a little bit and I got really interested in hiking, but like the long trail was like set seemed like a better length than the AT. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little more approachable to start. <laughs> <laughs> and we had actually never oh, we had spent one night in a tent as a family before our first night on the long trail. So we, we had no experience as a family. And you can still do it. That's good to hear. Yep. Cool. Anyone else? Well, I just, uh, first time I hiked it, I just retired and I, I just, I love being in the woods and I like the idea of living in the woods for that long period of time. 
And the second time, it's just really something really wonderful to do with my grandson and a great way to spend time with him. Yeah. With group to be was an incredible experience. That's great to hear. Yeah, and was it, was it your idea, Rock Hopper? Um, I thought it was cool that Grandpa hiked the long trail. So I decided that I wanted to do it. And then I did it. Nice. <laughs> Um, so the one thing that people always ask me about hiking and, and going on a long hike is what's the coolest thing that happened to you? Cause you know, you're just like walking in the woods every day and it might seem like every day is the same, but there's gotta be like, you know, that one cool thing that happened. So does anyone have like the cool thing that they tell people when they only have like an elevator ride to tell them about their long trail hike? That too tough of a question. <laughs> I I would say swimming in that brook that uh, at the base of Clarendon Gap and uh, watching my grandson dive off the rocks down there was pretty incredible. Yeah, that sounds nice. I would have to say also it's just being out there in nature and connecting with like on a spiritual level with nature and just being able to enjoy like the sunsets every day and the sunrises and like you just come across a very simple like pond and you're just like oh my god this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen it just like it just turns into such a it's just like so I so hard to explain it is a very strong emotion yeah. <laughs> it's very emotional that's great well I thought it was pretty cool uh I just met a bunch of really cool people out there never would have met otherwise like I don't think I ever had like a bad experience with another person on the trail it's always cool to meet all the new people yeah I, I always tell people I got soaked within the first hour of hiking <laughs> I liked swimming in all the water places but then I also liked um getting to the top of the 4,000 footers yeah yeah, and like both of you mentioned, there is a lot of water on the long trail coming from above and below, for sure. Um, all right, well, I know food was a hot topic. Everyone's always curious, what do you eat while you're hiking? Um, so I'm just curious what people's different like cooking routines were. Um, if anyone, uh, Talita, do you want to start? So my cooking routine, yeah. So I had breakfast, lunch, and dinner and snacks all throughout the day. Um, my breakfast, I'll just kind of like go really quick. I have like like three days worth of all different meals for different, you know, for examples. But I had either like oatmeal or like a, I had like a chocolate powder protein shake with powdered milk. Um, for lunch, I always had some sort of wrap with tuna and like chips and honey mustard or whatever, whatever I could get. Um, well, lots of bars and meat sticks and chewy candies. And for dinner, I had an MSR um, stove with a little pot. And I basically cooked myself either north sides or ramen noodles and stuff like that. Anything I could boil in water, pretty much. <laughs> cool, thanks. Anyone else? Um, I would just say that hiking with kids, I, I definitely overpacked on food just because I was like, we're never going to bonk. And I was very on top of them constantly eating throughout the day. Um, but we did the same thing, like hot breakfast, oatmeal, I had coffee, um, which was a treat that I never did on the Appalachian Trail. And, um, and then we had just camp meals for dinner and then we would just have wraps and peanut butter and meat sticks and pretzels and whatever, you know, kind of we, we were craving that four or five day section we would load up on. Did you have like a, an extra big pot so you could cook for all three of you? No, we went um, very lightweight in all ways. So we carried one bowl, one tiny bowl, one cup that I would have um, my coffee and dinner. And then we would eat out of the camp meal packet. Oh. Um, then we had three different things and then we would save that first camp meal packet for breakfast and we did oatmeal out of the dinner. Um, nice. So yeah, we, we were all about, I was all about lightweight. Yeah. 
drinking Jesse, the water and everything. Jesse, can I ask you a question? If you made coffee, did you have coffee grounds or did you do instant coffee or what? I did instant coffee and it was pretty good. The like Starbucks was um, was really good. I tried like, I don't know, some sort of like vanilla latte <laughs> in, <laughs> which was really not good, but the Starbucks coffee was actually really good. And it was, I would wake up before the kids and it was such a great way to start the day and yeah, have and coffee. And the ritual. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I had a coffee ritual <laughs> that I would make coffee the night before and have it all ready to go in the morning with a, put a little lid on it. And I, first thing when I'd wake up, I'd just drink cold coffee and that got me on the trail a lot faster. I wouldn't have to stop and eat a lot of water and wait for my coffee to cool. And it was actually pretty good. There you go. Ice coffee. We also mixed up our meals a little bit once in a while. If it were raining in the morning or we were wet, uh, we would eat our lunch in the morning because lunch was usually very already prepared. And then we'd stop along the trail after the rain stopped and cook our breakfast uh, about lunch time. And just you, you make those adjustments. Yeah. Makes it interesting. Yeah, I did it. I did it similar to everybody else on on a long days where um, I would try and get a lot of miles in. I would usually eat like a no cook breakfast, usually like pop tarts or stuff like that. And then almost always for lunch, I had uh, tortillas with tuna and I always got it uh, in oil because it's higher, with, higher in fat. Oh yeah, there you go. And rock hopper, what'd you, what'd you do for cooking? Um. Grandpa did all the cooking, but. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> you did all um, my favorite meal you know, is chili mac and beef, the freeze dried stuff. Oh, yeah, that is good. Nice. And then I'd have hot cocoa. Oh, okay, cool. John, um, do you mind if I ping in a couple of question and answer questions? Yeah, sure. Did any of the panelists um, go stoveless? Everybody likes their hot food and their coffee. Hot food, <laughs> all the way. Um, and does anyone have any particular food allergies that might have affected that? Whether you're a vegetarian or you're vegan, or you or it's a or or an allergy that you might have. Um, my one child who ended up getting injured in the beginning, he has to follow a keto diet. So I saw somebody asked about a vegan um, diet, which is totally different. But at the same time, there's so many different camp foods out there you can find just about anything um and I, I think a vegan diet would be really easy to follow um i i liked having the having the time to heat the food just because my kids really like to be at camp so we were there for hours so that was just part of our ritual but you definitely could go without a stove if you wanted cool. um and i'm curious how uh, different people stored their food. So how about we raise our hands? To, who did bear hangs? Okay. Niels, what did you do? Sometimes? I, I used an Ursac. Okay. Cool. Yep, that's, that's what I've used historically. That's what we had. Okay, cool. Yeah, just a, a and we hung it. We had a we had that sack and we hung it. And hung it. Cool. Yeah, that's what I did. Great. Yeah, yeah. This this past year was a active year, shall we say, for bear activity. Um, there was a bear put down at the Bedell shelter uh, because it had gotten hikers' food. Um, so I'll just take this time to say that the the GMC uh, strongly recommends the use of a bear canister now. And everyone should know know how to use it if they have one. Put it in a secure place so that a bear doesn't bat it off of a cliff or into a stream. Um, if that's not possible, um, well, I, I guess I should say that the first option is to use a, a um, bear box if it's provided at the shelter. Uh, then a, a bear canister if you have one. Um, and the last option um, is a... Uh, a bear hang, but that's the least preferred option because most of them that I've seen at least are uh, not not to spec, I guess I would say. 
Um, they're, they're pretty easy for bears to get down, I think. Um, so uh, let's move on from there. Um, so I saw a question already about um, tenting and, and shelters. Um, did anyone have a, a preference or um, what, what was your approach to, to selecting that? Um, Tom, do you wanna go first? Well, I, uh, second time I usually let Cyrus decide, uh, Brockhopper, and he tended to prefer the shelters, but once in a while the tent, uh, sometimes the shelter was full and we would use a tent to apply. Uh, and, uh, I tended to prefer the tent, but uh, I, many times I had a shelter to myself and that was kind of nice too. So it was back and forth. I, I love the shelters and I love my tent. Yeah. Jesse, how'd you do it with the kids? Um, we never had a night alone at a shelter or a tent site. Um, we had left it up to them. They liked the shelters. I thought at the end, yeah, I called them shelter rats because I'm like, really? I, I really liked the tent, but they liked the shelter. We had a pretty small three person tent, so it was cozy. It was a three person tent. <laughs> A very small three-person tent. So if there was room, we ended up staying in shelters quite a bit. Yeah. Talita? Uh, so as for me, yeah, I brought a tent. I stayed mostly in my tent um, because of my dog, too. Unless we were, like, alone at a shelter, I would just sleep in the shelter. Um, I did notice that throughout the entire, like, southern section before we hit uh, Route 4, which is where the Inn at Long Trail is, that's where the trail branches off from the Appalachian Trail. So up until that point, the, all the shelters were pretty much packed like every night, so I was glad I had my tent. Um, I even brought the vestibule accessory that I attached to the front of my tent, and that's where my dog slept. She slept right under the vestibule outside the tent. Um, but I did notice that I like after um, the eight, the long trail separated from the Appalachian Trail, I slept it, uh, most nights alone in the shelter with my dog, um, so it wasn't too bad after that. Yeah, it can be pretty quiet in the northern section of the trail, for sure. Niels, what'd you do? Uh, I preferred the shelters. Um, I had a tent just in case the shelters were full, but yeah. Cool. That's then, always a, I'm gonna jump in for a sec, John. That's always a good idea, Niels, is carrying a tent as a backup or some type of emergency shelter. You don't know where you might get stuck um, and, and having that can really help out. And uh, did you all have just normal, like freestanding tents with poles? No? What'd you have, Jesse? Uh, it, it wasn't like a full on freestanding tent. It was almost, I forget even what it was. Like you needed trekking poles to hold it up or something? You needed, you, you could do it without, but it would kind of collapse on the front. Um, so it was like half freestanding. I can't believe I can't remember the name of it. I have it right here. <laughs> Um, and uh, I'm surprised there's no hammockers here actually. It's become so popular, but what yeah, we there? saw a lot of hammockers like on the AT section and yeah. uh, my son wished that we had one. And I saw somebody asked if there were spaces between shelters. There, I felt like it was more in the south than, you know, when you're on the AT section, not as much when you leave the AT. Yeah, there's certainly plenty of trees in Vermont, but there isn't always a great place to, to tent or hammock. We had a big Agnes tent, and uh, something interesting we discovered that if we had to take the tent down in the morning and if it were raining, we could take the inner tent down and keep the fly up and keep everything dry as we packed. And the only thing that was wet when we left the campsite was the rain fly. It was pretty slick. Nice. And, uh, what could you, what sleep system did you use? And uh, like what sleeping bag and sleeping pad? And remind us again, what time of year you hiked just so we have a, a sense of, of how that worked. Uh, Niels, do you wanna go? Um, I hiked in late July and August, so it was pretty warm. And I had a quilt that I made myself. Um, it's a copy of the Enlightened Equipment Revelation Quilt. And then I had a Climate Pad, um, one of the, I think it's the Static V. 
Um, I just like the inflatable pads because they're more comfortable. But... Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, we went in June and we used quilts and there was a few nights that it was a little chilly in the quilt. Um, like we would wear a puff, our you know, puff ball jacket in the quilt. Didn't you think it was cold a few times? And we had the lightweight thermarest pads and um, they're super loud. That's, that's my only. Yeah. They're crinkly. Really crinkly. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of a weird crinkly noise that you would never think exists either. Which is just funny. And, and amplified when you're in a, a shelter. <laughs> Tom, what did you use? Uh, just a lightweight sleeping bag and an inflatable, um, lightweight inflatable pad. And uh, I just can tell you what he used. Yeah. How about you, Rockhopper? I had a thermorest. Uh, ground pad <clears throat> and a mountain hardware sleeping bag. Cool. So everyone, everyone stayed warm out there for the most part. Nice. I was even uh, worried about if I should bring my puppy jacket, and I feel like that's something a lot of people have asked me too. I did not bring my puppy jacket. I even purchased like a lightweight puffy specifically for the trail and I didn't even bring it because I didn't even need it. I, I, I have like a light grid fleece. That's what I slept in and if I got cold I would go in my sleeping bag and I was pretty much fine the whole time. Yeah. Um, so did anyone have a, a favorite place that they spent the night? Talita, you I, I would say yeah. probably puffer shelter. Yeah. What about what yeah, about like that? The sunrise, there. the sunrise, yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful view there, for sure. For me, I'd say Stark's Nest. That was awesome there. I love that place. Anyone else? I like Thorndine a lot. Very nice view from there, and Whiteface. Oh yeah, Whiteface is nice. It's we hit Puffer in like the worst mosquito storm. It's you know the only. Uh, we carried bug nets and that was like one of the only days when I wore it. I mean, it was like, it was horrible trying to get water and it was swarming everywhere, hot, muggy day. Um, and we had just a magical night on the top of Bromley, the warming hut there. There was people out in their hammocks. It was just, you know, sunshine. And we spent hours up there. That was amazing. What? And yeah, Elliot found like sticks and built the house. So. <laughs> night yeah yeah we talk a lot about the shelters but you can have some really nice nights on on top of the ski areas where it's all mowed down and you can see all around it's certainly a viable option for a, a wonderful night on the trail rock hopper did you have a, a favorite night on the trail um I really enjoyed when we spent the night at the Inn at Long Trail. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my dad came and joined us, and it seemed amazing compared to Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's a, that's a step up. I would say, yeah, the Inn at the Long Trail is probably a little, a little cozier than Cooper Lodge. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, did anyone have uh, a particularly bad night's sleep out there? Oh, Rock Harbor, you're probably gonna say Cooper now. You can nod your head, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyone else? I had a pretty crazy experience. So um, I was hiking throughout July and I remember it was the 5th of July and my two girlfriends had come out to hike with me for a week. And we were like, we stopped and we were camping at the Clarendon Gorge because it was like a nice little river. We were like swimming in the river, like perfect water source, like perfect camp spot. We were like, this is great. We went to bed. And then as soon as we went to sleep, a bunch of like people, I think that came from, because the street is like not even half a mile away. A bunch of hooligans came and started <laughs> setting off really loud fireworks, like only like 50 feet from where we were camping. And we were like all asleep at this point and my dog started freaking out and it was like the loud banging fireworks. 
it was pretty scary <laughs> at that point. And when we got up to go like find out what was going on, they all just disappeared into thin air. <laughs> it was definitely startling. Yeah. Fifth of July. Yeah. That's good. Um, I when I went to um the Tucker Johnson shelter, I think it is, um, my friend had just barely joined me to do a three day section with me. And when we got there, there was just terrible swarms of mosquitoes. And we, yeah, we barely slept. And then at like midnight, we set up the tent and slept in there. Yeah, the, the bugs can be uh, one of the biggest hazards out there sometimes of the year, for sure. Um, well, cool. That gets us through a few topics that we wanted to cover. Um, I think we're going to transition now. And um, did you want to do a, a poll now, Lauren? Uh, not, not quite yet. I, I might have a question or two, John, that I want to put out there, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so we just talked about some stuff. Um, let me just look through and make sure that I didn't miss anything too bad. A lot of people asked about the temperature rating of everyone's sleeping stuff. I, when I threw hiked, I, I used the 30. Did anybody go drastically different than that? I use a 20. I cool. use a 30. Yeah. That seems to be, that, was, that was asked by a number of people, so I think we, we knocked a lot off there. Um, um, okay, cool. So now we're going to mix things up a little, and we're going to do a rapid fire round. So I have uh, a few questions that are like one word or one sentence answers that we're gonna go through and um, just like common questions that, that people uh, ask of bikers that are fairly simple to answer. So um, we'll start uh, with what was your favorite piece of gear and just uh, whoever can think of it first can go. Okay, I'm up. Um, I wore a really thin long sleeve shirt instead of a short sleeve shirt. I mean, that's all the only shirt I brought. Um, and it was perfect because it kept the bugs off, but it never got too hot, but it was also warm if it was cold. Nice. Good choice. Oh, my Hoka hat. I'm wearing it right now too. Just extra comfy? Oh yeah. <laughs> nice. Alita? Um, I would say my satellite tracker because that thing got me out of lots of times where I lost a trail and it saved my life. So my satellite okay. tracker. Nice. I liked um, my L.L. Bean fleece. Oh yeah. Tom, I saw you hold up a, a stove there. Stove. Oh, you're muted there, Tom. Oh, he's muted. Oh, I tried to unmute you, but I didn't. Sorry. Oh, okay, it's, it's this little stove. It's a wood, burns wood or pine cones or birch bark, and so I didn't have to carry any fuel, and it was kind of fun to fool around with. I carried some pellets along just in case uh, I didn't find any dry firewood, but I was always able to find something dry somewhere. Nice. I had to keep my pot in a plastic bag so it wouldn't get my clothes all wet or black, but uh, otherwise it's a great little toy. Yeah, that's handy. Yeah. Um, Eva had one. Yeah. Um, I just liked my long underwear because I got to like get into bed at night and it was always clean. Oh yeah. Oh, can I jump in with a question there? Um. So you were saying how you carried an extra set of clothes, but you didn't really wear them. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have a change of clothes for bedtime? Yeah, I had like a set of just like light long underwear that I put on at camp. But um, otherwise, I just wore like the same shorts and like a shirt for hiking every day. But I carried an extra set of clothes just in case I ever got wet. I never really needed it. Cool. Thank you. Um, what was on your feet while you were hiking? Um, for me, I wore in gingy socks. Um, they're like toe socks and they're super cushiony because I always get blisters on the tops of my toes. 
I wore those and I wore Merrell's like super lightweight hiking boots. I had, uh, I had darn tough socks and then um, Merrill trail runners. Jesse? We wore darn tough socks, Keek and Randall special edition. And we all wore like trail running shoes. I wore sock liners and darn tough socks and uh, low cut hiking shoes. I wore um, a range. I wore hiking boots. My favorite were trail running shoes and smart wool and darn tough. So you changed your, your shoes at some point because yeah. you were hurting? What? Why did you change your footwear during the trip? Because I section hiked it. Oh, okay. So you had different different shoes for different sections. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Let's see. How do I would you add here that this is not an advertisement for Darn Tough, even though their socks are so great. I expected that. That was fun. <laughs> I almost did. <yeah. laughs> um, how, did, how did you purify your water? Salida? Um, I used a Katahdin pump filter. So basically, there's like a dirty tube and a clean tube. You stick the dirty tube in the water. You stick the clean tube in your water bladder, water bottle, whatever, and you pump it. The great thing about that was I literally had water no matter what. I ended up showing up to some shelters that were dry. The, the water source was completely dry. I ended up like, I, at one point, I literally dug a hole in the ground until I found like muddy water. And that's how I got my water. I filtered that water. So. Niels, I saw you got something in your hand there. Yeah, uh, I used a Sawyer Mini and I put it in line in my uh, water bladder. And then so my water bladder slides open so I could scoop up water really easily and then use it like on the trail to drink water directly or use it as a gravity filter in camp. Nice. We used Aqua Mirror. Cool. Drops. Jesse? used a Sawyer also. And um, and a smart water smart water bottle sometimes, um, but we had the Sawyer mini, minis, and we also used the um, I don't even know what it's called, like the big water thing that you just showed, Niels, which I noticed most through hikers had bottles, but I found it really easy to have the hose just going into your mouth, so you didn't have to stop, pull out a bottle. It was much easier. Did you have one filter for each of you? Or did you? No. Sure no, we, sh we shared everything. We had, we brought two filters at all times. But one of them broke. Yeah, these, split these bags, actually, we had three different ones break. Um, you know, when you're squeezing them, the, they split at the top. So that's a little, we had two break on the same day. But luckily, we had a smart bottle. bottle. So that's something to look out for. Be prepared. Yep. Um, how did you navigate? Did you use a map, a GPS. I know, Talita, you said you used a device there or an app or anything. Uh, I used, so yeah, I had my device. I also had a map and I had my guidebook with me. I had the uh, long trail map and I had an altimeter watch and then just kind of did calculations in my head for distance and altitude and stuff like that. Cool. We used a long trail guide and just used the maps in there. Nice. I had Greta. We had an outdated guide, map, <laughs> and a GPS. You didn't have to tell that part. <laughs> All of the blazes. We used Gut Hook. Okay. Um, a map and the long trail map. Great. It was like our favorite entertainment every night was the long trail map. Like, mm -hmm map out like if we did this tomorrow then we'd be here and then we'd be there that was our only entertainment yeah it's amazing how much fun you can have looking at the next day yeah what's ahead of us and where have i been john do you mind if i chime in for a sec yeah um 
and everyone should know that the GMC, the headquarters are still shipping out uh, maps and guidebooks if you need. Um, so depending on whenever, whenever you're planning, um, you can get that. And then the Long Trail map and um, the Long Trail guidebook are available um, through an iPhone app as well. It's relatively new. It's really good. It works like a GPS. You don't need data. Um, and you can, you can find that on the website as well. So check that out if you're interested in a, in a mapping app for, for your long trail hike. Um, what was your favorite treat on trail, whether candy or Slim Jims? Um, I always had the Nutella with breadsticks to go. That was like wow. my favorite treat. Very specific. <laughs> Anyone else? Fritos. Oh, yes. <laughs> Naturally. Um, I like to have sour gummy worms, and we always had them. Um, my brother carried them because if I had them, I would just eat them all, but he was very good at, like, divvying them out. So we would get them, like, whenever I was bonking, or we just, like, reached a certain point that we would just have, like, one sour gummy worm, and it's really good. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I like Snickers and jelly beans. Cool. Tom, what was your treat? I, don't I like eating Cyrus's jelly beans. <laughs> and I like a little beef jerky now and then, and almonds are always good. There you go. Um, let's see. Uh, throughout the whole trip, what was, what was your... Um, what was your favorite meal that you had during your hike, uh, both on trail and if you got off trail, you know, what, what, what was that meal as well? Talita? For me, my favorite meal I'd say was I had these like dried, it's like dry rice with vegetables. It was like boya meal, and it took so long to cook it, but it was like so good and so filling. Best food I had. Off the trail, I went directly to Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> um, on the trail, me and my brother really liked like this fettuccine Alfredo like camp meal that we had, and it was always like so like exciting to look forward to it all day. But off the trail. Like, um, we got to go to Skinny Pancake, and it was, like, my first time ever, and it was, like, amazing. It was really good. <laughs> nice. I liked uh, Mountain House freeze-dried spaghetti on the trail. And then, oh, yeah, with meat sauce. And then um, off the trail, I liked Chipotle. Rock <laughs> <laughs> copper? I liked... Um, my favorite meal was when I had French toast wow. after coming down Killington. And then um, I also liked Ben and Jerry's when we got off and we did we went to a and b Cool. We'd also stop in Montpelier a couple times at the gelato shop. That was delicious. Oh, wow. Nice. Um, let's see. What side trail or off trail destination do you think was worth the time? Worth the time. Um so for me I every like because I feel like like Killington the trail didn't go like directly to the peak so we had to walk like point two off the trail to get to the actual summit. And like Belvedere was like the same, like any trails that go to the peak or to the summit, I would say is worth it for sure. Jesse? Yeah, we were gonna say Killington because it's super steep. You know, you start up and you're like, oh, and we were heading to town. So we really wanted to get to town, but it's such a great view up there and it's totally worth it. Yeah, every side trail is worth it. I mean, you're just out there to be, so. Take them all, and swimming. Every swimming hole is also worth it. That's the answer we're looking for. Yeah. I like the uh, Clara Bow Trail near Taylor Lodge. It's really cool. There's like a ladder there. You go through some caves and stuff. Cool. Tom? 
Oh, I think uh, the side trail at Belvedere and Killington probably, yeah. Uh, can I jump in? Somebody asked if they need to pack bathing suits. I've seen a lot of no. sideways. <laughs> you just jump, jump in in the clothes you've been hiking in all day. That's how you keep them clean. That's right. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, that's that's all the uh, the quick questions I had for you. In oh, this. John, do you want me to do my poll? Oh yeah, yeah. So do you want to do the poll now? Oh yeah, all you out in the audience, we want to know a little bit about you too. So, bada boom. Getting some back, huh? So interested to see what the favorite candy bar is always. Wow. So I do see a question here that's towards me, and I'd like to answer it live. Go ahead. Um, so there's actually a few questions here. One of them is, are there any areas in the north where you will need to provide assistance to your dog? And that is yes. There is one specific section that a lot of the southbound hikers were like asking me, like every time I would go across someone on the trail, they would be like, oh, how are you going to get past with your dog with ladder ravine? How are you going to get past ladder ravine with your dog? There's really steep ladders. Like multiple people brought that up to me and I was really worried about that. Um, and it, when I got there, it did end up being like, it was like one 12 foot painter's ladder, like straight down, super steep. Um, the way I prepared to do that was I brought a pulley system and I had Nala pack it out in her bag and I basically had planned on like using pulleys to bring her down the ladder but I did find that I basically like went around to the left a little bit I just like went off the trail around to the left where it was like not so steep and she just like jumped off the big rocks and she was fine and I didn't even need anything and also there's a lot of ladders going up Mansfield um, up the forehead so I just took the forehead bypass trail and I just went all around all the ladders and that was fine. Um, I did not bring an emergency dog harness, but you know, if you feel like your dog may need something like that, I definitely would bring something like that. They're pretty light. There's one thing called a pack a paw harness, which is like something you can just pack in your dog's bag. And as for rest days, we only had one zero day. We had a few Nero's, but we only had one zero day. She was like running ahead of me the whole time, pretty much. I was, I was trying to keep up with her. <laughs> Thanks, Talita. Good to answer some of those dog questions. I know a lot of folks like hiking with their dogs out there. Another one, John, that might be nice, just where we're at right now, people are still doing the poll and that is, um, does somebody want to describe what they might see as advantages or disadvantages to going north versus south or south versus north? Uh, I think I, I thought southbound was pretty smart um, because I, I did a lot of training before uh, going to the trail. So I thought starting out fresh on the tough sections and then finishing it off easier. I like going north because it, it sort of works up to a climax. You start low in the woods and it's relatively gentle compared to the north and then it just gets tougher and tougher and, and more spectacular as you go so it's just a it's a storyline or a, a symphony or whatever you want to say but it's nice to build up for me to a climax cool i agree with tom yeah i also agree the southern was definitely a lot nicer than the northern half. It was definitely very rugged, more rugged than I had anticipated. Another question, I guess, Niels, you said it, but maybe somebody, if, if anybody else has a thing, is there something that you all did specifically to train, you know, to get ready for hiking 270 miles all at, at a time or in pieces? Um, I think it's important to like wear your backpack with like weight in it just to make sure you like the feel of it. And like for my mom, like it hurt her shoulder. So she like put a little bit of padding in, but like if you start the trail and your backpack's uncomfortable, it's like a real bummer because it just hurts. 
I, I definitely, I made my kids like, you know, we did not an insane hiking, but a lot of day hiking where they could at least break in their shoes. We could make sure everybody's equipment worked before we were committed to being out there in the woods. Yeah, I agree. I did like progressive day hikes and a lot of running uh, during the week. And then, yeah, that was mostly it. Day hikes always, I, I always have my uh, pack with weight in it. Yeah, I pretty much did the same too. I did a lot of day hikes um, with my bag fully packed and my dog's bag fully packed. I made sure she was trained. You know, she's German Shepherd, 97 pounds, 80, 87 pounds of pure muscle. So I just had to make sure that she was, you know, good enough shape to be able to do something like that. Oh, I can share the poll results, John. Wow, Snickers just crushing the competition. M&M's and Reese's got a little play, some Twix in there too, but it's tough to, and I say this as a person who's allergic to peanuts, tough to beat that combination of fats and sweets and sugars that you get in a Snickers bar. You get everything in there. And then yeah, a lot of people going for a squeeze filter. There's certainly a lot of convenience in that. Like, yeah, Neil's had a pretty unique system there, and um, yeah, Jesse was using them as well. So, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, Lauren, did you have any other questions that you wanted to ask right now? Yeah, there's been a decent amount of talk about resupplying as well and how to do gear drops or other stuff like that. So, um, Maybe if, if either of you, any of you want to speak up to that, that'd be great too. Um, Jesse, you know, you, you live in Burlington, you were able to have help on your hike? Yeah, uh, it was easy for us um, because my husband didn't hike with us. So he just, I packed all the boxes beforehand um, and he would just meet us every four or five days and we would just, Pull from the back of the car based on what we needed. Um, and then I'm from Bennington, Vermont, which is down south where the trail starts. And that's where my dad still is. So I, he had a box of stuff. So yeah, we were spoiled. It was easy. Yeah, I, I had it similar. I live in Berlin, Vermont. And so um, my family would come and I had all my um, food that I wanted for those specific days um in ziploc bags and then i would like get a fresh meal and my ziploc of food and switch hiking partners usually it was good Talita, how did it go for you being so as for me i was supported i was originally supposed to through hike with my boyfriend and my dog but like a week before we were supposed to start he got a new job and had to go down to baltimore to do training but only like two weeks after i was hiking so for the first few weeks uh, he would drive out to me every weekend and meet me wherever and he would resupply me and when he wasn't around I basically used these buckets and I would hang them from trees at different road crossings or he would leave them for me in the trees and it would say like where they were located my my trail name wolf mama um, it would say what date that I was supposed to arrive to be picking it up and we would basically like bear hang it from a tree and that's how I would resupply. And also for Nala's food too, like she eats a very specific, she has a very specific diet. She eats a, only, a kibble that is very high in chondrion and glucosamine just for her joints. But anyway, so I had to make sure that she was eating the, the right food the whole time. So instead of like going into town and buying like just random dog brands of food, I was like, how am I gonna do this? So I basically just had like hung up bags of her food in the trees and, it was just there waiting for us all throughout the trail. Tom and Rockhopper, did you have family bringing food for you along the way? With the, uh, since we section hiked together, we had our full supply with us. Um, the last section we did was, I think, 65. So we didn't have one mail drop there. We spent one night at a Airbnb and we had the food shipped to the Airbnb. The first hike I had a package sent to Manchester and we picked it up there. But I occasionally would have friends join me on the hike and I knew ahead of time who was going to join me and where. So I would 
I gave them food to to give me drops. So it all worked out pretty well. It needed some organization, but it worked out beautifully. Yeah, yeah. It seems like a lot of the folks we have on the panel had a lot of family or friends join them for different sections. So we definitely recommend you know inviting your friends to come along for a hike with you, but secretly you just want them to bring you food. <laughs> Very good strategy. Nail drops are difficult because you don't have uh, you don't like going through many towns or close to many towns, so it's difficult. You really have to get off the trail to pick up your mail drop. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Post offices can be tricky. Sure. John, do you mind if I address a question in the Q and A? Um, so Brian asked a little bit about how resupply could be affected by COVID, and it's kind of what Mike talked about. You know, it's pretty unlikely that you'll be able to get a hitchhiking ride. Um, shuttles might not be running this year. I know that a number of shuttles are closed already they're anticipating being closed and then uh, as tom said the launch route does not go through towns so you've got much longer walks into towns um so considering the ways that you can have friends or local acquaintances in vermont support you so before you get to a road crossing give them a call have them come get your food and you keep on going or walking um you know the the least that you have to get off the trail and the least that you have to have reliance on other things, the better. Good point, Lauren, thank you. Um, all right, so we talked a little bit about getting to the trail and around it. Once you're on the trail, how often did your plans change? And when they did, how did you respond? Alita? Um, so for me, um, plans change pretty much daily. Um, basically I just would look at what terrain I was coming up on and like, you know, how long it would take me to do whatever, how many, how many however many miles with the elevation gain. So like in the beginning I had planned out like every day exactly where I would sleep, but like I ended up realizing that the trail was a lot more rugged than I thought. So I like my mouth, my miles were lower than I expected. Um, and I also had to listen to my dog and like how she was doing and what like what she needed. Um, so I basically would call too. Like I would just call my support, my boyfriend, and I would just be like, hey, help me out. <laughs> like, this is what's going on. Like, where should I go? How far should I go? You know, that's how plans change for me. Anyone else? We kind of went into it with no, with a very loose plan of maybe it'll take us three weeks. Um, the kids moved a lot faster than I thought they would. Um, but yeah, I always just brought two full days of extra food. As I said, I overpacked on food, but that's like the mom. Um, so then we could just totally be flexible. And I had a cell phone, so then I could just say where we were going to show up. But it, it, I, we always changed plans. We just went with the flow. Yeah. Anyone else? Have your, have your plans changed or did everything go smoothly? Uh, my plans changed quite a bit. I, I planned out pretty specifically the shelters I wanted to go to, but um, generally the people I was hiking with um, would be, most of them were actually faster than I thought, so we, we ended up getting to places faster than I was expecting. That was nice. And Tom, with doing section hikes, did you find it easier to plan out and, and execute on, on what your itinerary was or did your plan still change along the way? I don't think our plans ever changed on this section hike or, or on my through hike. We just how we, I calculated things out. I guess I got lucky, but uh, uh, and with the weather as well, so no plans didn't change very much at all. Wow, great. Um, cool. Uh, so switching gear a little bit, um, talk about some of the, the hazards of the trail. I know bugs came up earlier, um, some, some swarms of mosquitoes making things difficult for folks. Uh, what did you do to protect yourself from uh, mosquitoes and, and ticks uh, on the trail? Yep. Um, for me, I had Nala use her tick. She has a tick hauler. That helped a lot. I didn't really have any big issues with ticks, um, but bugs and mosquitoes 
oh my god, I feel like no matter how much bug spray I use, it didn't make a difference because there was flies and mosquitoes and just bugs like swarming me all day, every single day. <laughs> yeah. But I did hike in July too, so that's like yeah. bug season, you know. That'll do it. We had bug nets like that went around our faces and that was nice for at camp at night, but usually like if you keep on walking, like it's the, <laughs> like it's not too bad, but if you stop, it's really horrible. Usually. That's maybe why we move so fast. Uh, we had, I mean, we hiked in June, which supposedly would have been bad, but it really was not bad. It was only the hot and muggy days. There was a few days. Um, the other thing we did is we treated um, like our socks, a lot of our clothing with some sort of, I forget what, that goes on like bug repellent clothing. So we bought the spray and we treated our clothing before we left. Um, I don't know if it helped. And that was supposed to help with ticks too. And we only had one tick between the four of us, because I also had a third kid in the beginning um, throughout the whole time. I don't, bugs weren't really uh, an issue for me that much. Um, and so I only used bug spray when um, I encountered a bunch of bugs. I carried like a small uh, container of Sawyer picker -Iden. I tried to schedule late July and August for most of the hiking and the bugs because the bugs were less during those times but I hiked many miles along the trail with a little fur switch uh, kind of flipping back both sides of my neck just to annoy them and keep them away. Cool. Some good strategies there. Um, and what did you do when the weather got bad? I know some of you probably just kept hiking Others maybe hunker down for the night. I have I have one story about that. So I was pretty lucky for me. It was sunny almost every day. I only got like two or three rainy days. One of those rainy days though was like this was one of the times where my plans really changed on me. It was right before I was going to hit that area called Ladder Ravine, which is where everyone was all like, "Oh my God, how are you going to do that with your dog?" And so I was planning on walking um, to Montclair Shelter, which is it's right to the south of Camel Sun, right before you climb. And that's where I was planning on sleeping that night. But I, was, I got to the shelter before. It was um, Cowles Cove shelter. And it was like a three-walled shelter. And I was only going to have lunch there. But I got there so late. And it was going to start raining soon. And when I got there, there was a sign that was like, do not cross Ladders Ravine in the dark or when it's raining like it's very dangerous and it was supposed to rain the whole next day which is when I was supposed to be crossing that area and I freaked out <laughs> I was like oh my god what am I gonna do I ended up calling my friends like calling my boyfriend asking for advice and that was when I ended up taking my zero day I just stay put for a whole day I waited the rain out and then the, the next day was super sunny and I ended up crossing ladder ravine and climbing camel sump and yeah but what a nice place to spend a zero day yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, one day we had like, the beginning of the day was fine, and but my mom was all worried the whole day because she was like, it's going to rain and we're going to like be going over like a mountain. No, I was like, a huge storm is coming. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't listen. So we were stuck and it was like downpouring and the river was just like, I mean, the trail was a river and we were like running through it. And it was it like was lightning, thunder. <laughs> that was Belvedere Mountain. We didn't do that side trail, but it, it was actually, it, it was, was pretty scary. Was like scary. I, I had, we assumed the lightning position because we were you know, coming across that, that edge running and, you know, thankfully they're able to run. Um, but then, you know, it was just all around us. And then Elliot, like there was like a log that was like going across the top of the trail and my brother Elliot, he just ran right into it. Yeah. banged his head and we all freaked out because it was like pouring rain and it was like lightning and stuff and we were like super scared and we thought like he would like have a horrible headache but he just got back up he's like oh that was cool and he kept on going but we were it was like still nerve-wracking it was pretty intense <laughs> <laughs> we covered a lot of miles that day in running for our lives <laughs> Niels did you have any bad weather events on your journey uh I I did I had a bunch of thunderstorms. Um, usually, I just hiked through them. Uh, I would, I, I would, if the if we were 
coming up on elevation, I would like stay put in a shelter or at lower elevation till the storm would pass. And then uh, I usually got really warm in my shell while I was hiking. So I'd stick my arms through the pit vents, um, kind of vent off my arms, but yeah. Nice. Cyrus, do you have any uh, crazy weather out there? We had one really rainy day. That was our um, day before the B and B, but um, it was actually pretty nice because it kept us cool and we yeah. didn't overheat at all. That's so amazing. we just hiked through it. And you were going to be spending the night in the B and B. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. And. Uh, that's great. Lauren, do we have any uh, new questions popping up? Yeah, there's a couple that um, that might be good. Um, some thoughts about about water quality um, and, and water, uh, the amount of water at places. Essentially, if you're hiking on the trail and there is water in the trail, then there's probably going to be water at the water sources that you're trying to go to. Um, but some do run drier earlier than others. And other folks on the trail can tell you that the long trail guide can tell you that the GMC's um, visitor center can tell you also which ones are dry or not. We keep track of that. So I just answered that right away. Cause I figured it'd be pretty easy. Um, uh, let's see what else. Oh, can you all speak about, this has been a really popular question. What was the way to your packs? So I didn't actually weigh my pack, but it was huge. So I would say it was probably 35 to 45 pounds. Um, so my goal was to go as lightweight as possible. So the kids, like we carried nothing. In fact, Ava was just saying, can we tell them we didn't even need our rain jacket? Um, so we only, you know, one extra pair of socks, like one cup, one bowl for the three of us. It made it a lot easier because there was three of us to distribute weight. And then also, you know, like Ava could carry 10 pounds, um, Elliot carried 15, and then I would carry 20. Or as the day went on, if somebody was tired, we could swap weight back and forth. Um, but the average weight of our packs was under 20 pounds. So we, we really carried nothing. Jesse, was there a thing that you sacrificed that got you down to that low base weight? You have to sacrifice a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the kids, I was like, no, 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 no. I mean, everything you could think of, like toothbrushes, underwear, extra clothing. Yeah, yeah we had one underwear. <laughs> Not a lot, yeah. One underwear for all three of you. <laughs> yeah, it really helps to have three people because then you're only carrying one stove I and mean, we all crammed into one really lightweight tent we had the quilts we had the lightweight sleeping pads but no books no um no nothing we did carry a pack of cards <laughs> um, that's a good thing to bring yeah. <laughs> yeah so we had a luxury item yes yeah, so we everybody was allowed a luxury item um but i it it allowed us to just it felt more enjoyable for other I would have been carrying 40 pounds, which would, would have been hard. Cool, thanks. I like to keep my pack around 25 pounds if I can. When uh, Rockhopper and I started the trail, he was only six years old, so I did carry most of the weight. So that was a little heavier, uh, closer to 35 or so. But uh, every chance I got, I'd unload weight onto him every year so that I was kind of building him up. So that by the end he was carrying quite a bit of the weight and uh, I was back down around between, you know, around 30 pounds. My pack was around like uh, 19, 20 pounds the whole time. I usually split the tent and stove and stuff uh, with the person I was hiking with. That's smart. Um. That's the that's the bulk of the the ones, John. I think there's some other stuff in there that I can work on, but yeah. Well, <clears throat> we're getting on to 7:30 now, so um, maybe we can. Uh, I know it's gone by pretty quickly. Um, but we made it through all the all the questions that, for the most part, that we had lined up. So planned that out pretty well, I suppose. Um, so uh, 
we're going to um, transition now to finishing up the panel. Um, what we're going to do is ask the panelists a couple questions. And while they're thinking about their answers, we'll do a, a quick poll with everyone, with all the attendees. Then uh, we'll hear their responses. And then we'll finish with a photo slideshow uh, from pictures that all these uh, these folks generously agreed to share with you all. Um, so panelists, what was your biggest obstacle along the way? That's question one. And then question two is, if you could only give someone one piece of advice about hiking the long trail, what would it be? So we'll do the poll now of all the attendees. Okay, great. And uh, we'll let folks think about that. This question for a couple minutes here. Did this virtual end-to-end -end panel better prepare you? <laughs> Thanks, Belita. Are you asking me? There we go. Also, everybody, be true there. We're uh, we're we're able to take a um, take whatever you say. John, we have sixty five percent. Nice. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, I can probably, we could probably stop that. For, for those of you who uh, said somewhat helpful, you know, would be certainly interested in, in taking your feedback. Uh, this is the first time we've hosted an end to end panel like this. So, uh, um, you know, it's uh, certainly a, a, a learning experience for all of us trying to uh, uh, figure this out. Yeah, and if I might add to that, there's a lot of questions that did come in that we maybe weren't able to get to everybody. So I tried to do the ones that had the most, um, the most that were similar. Um, the GMC is always available to answer those as well. So reach on out. So, panelists, what was your biggest obstacle along the way? We'll start with Jesse. Um, well, mine was after like the first few days, you start to run out of things to talk about. So just like new things always come up, but it can get a little boring at times to just get by that and just keep going. And then new things come up to talk about and there's new things to do. Uh, biggest obstacle um, was, I guess my, my third child getting in a couple days in and getting him out of the woods. Um, my big, biggest obstacle was sleep because, I mean, some nights I would fall asleep, but um, a lot of nights I had a hard time sleeping, which was, and if I didn't sleep well, then the next day I would just be tired and, yeah. Kalita? Um, my biggest obstacle, I'd say, was when I was three days in and Nala took a big poop and there was a tapeworm in there. So I had to like figure out where I could get meds for her, which vet was accessible and all this and that. And the, the vet I usually take her to, they ask for a stool sample. So obviously I couldn't do that. So my boyfriend actually went to a vet in Rutland and told them the scenario and what was going on, that she's a trail dog. And the vet was like, oh yeah, that happens all the time. It's tapeworm. Um, here's the meds. And they just gave me the meds and I started giving them to her on trail and she was fine. And this was Eastwood Animal Clinic in Rutland, Vermont. Shout out. Um, well, um, Rockhopper really likes uh, to tell stories along the trail, and uh, he liked for me to tell stories. So, my biggest obstacle was coming up with enough ideas and enough stories to keep him going. Um, he was great to hike with, but we talked a lot. <laughs> Rockhopper? Um, my biggest obstacle? was 
some spots it was when I was when I first started out it was hard having sh very short legs because then you can't get over puddles and that kind of stuff so he said missing his mother and father <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Niels um, my biggest obstacle was um, getting uh, my hiking partners into my routine. <laughs> they always wanted to sleep in. <laughs> Great. And uh, if you could give one piece of advice to everyone listening, what, what would it be? Let's start with you, Niels. How about that? Um, I'd say like, plan it out very thoroughly uh plan yeah plan your through hike very thoroughly jesse elliot um well to enjoy all the nice spots like the summits and stuff there's a few times we would maybe like come up to a summit look around for like 30 seconds and then keep going and then we'd have our lunch 20 minutes later in the middle of the woods when <laughs> it's just important to enjoy the nice places and take advantage of them. Um, it's kind of related, but I would just say I was a little hesitant about just being a female and being alone out there with my kids and um, just that I found it a really safe, it felt safe and a welcoming environment as a woman. Um, Ava and I kept a tally of every night how many men versus women were in our campsites. It's definitely, it was male dominated, um, but there was... But we made a difference. So we liked the fact that if we weren't there a lot of nights, there would have been no women. Um, so there was two of us. So if you're a female and you're hesitant or you're a mother and you're hesitant, just go for it. It's a super safe kind of secret society up there. Oh, Ava. Um, bring, I mean, we'll try to bring like a hard map, like a map map, not like a digital map, because it's really fun to just like lie in your tent at night and you can like look at like the topography topography <laughs> and you can like look at the map and that helps you like see if there are any like pretty lakes or lookouts that you're gonna miss if you're just looking at like straight up like map of like only the long trail on any side trails so, yeah thanks rock hopper what do you think um i'd say um, keep a journal because it's fun to go back and read about what you've done. <laughs> That's a great tip. Tom? Well, um, hiking with my grandson, I would say not trying to put too many miles in in a day so that we had time to uh, enjoy our campsite or stop and take a swim or um, play cards or talk to other people. Um, we, we tried to keep it at a little bit of a relaxed pace and uh, it didn't, for us, it didn't need to be a marathon. And I think if, if you can do that, if you want to do that, I think it's important to plan it into your schedule. You don't have to finish it in case. You take so. 25, 30 days. <laughs> so I'd also agree with having a, a journal, you know, even if it's just like real quick at the end of the day, just write down a few notes about how your day was because that's definitely something you'll be looking back on and also just like having fun enjoying the moment you know it's not always you get an opportunity to do something like this and it's definitely something I will never forget so just like enjoy it and just be present and take it all in while you're out there. Thanks Lolita. Good parting words. Um, well uh, I realize we're a couple minutes over here um, but we're going to finish up with a slideshow um, with some photos from the panelists and then we'll uh, wrap things up after that. That's great. Here's a slideshow. I'm going to cry. Oh, there's no one. Come over here and look. Oh, the rock garden. Oh, <laughs> oh there's no sand. There's me in the mouth.
All right. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thank you to all the, the wonderful panelists who joined us here tonight. You all had some great experiences to share and uh, everyone really appreciates your, your time uh, committing to this and sharing your experience. Uh, please to all the attendees, be sure to check out greenmountainclub.org uh, for updates on uh, the trail and upcoming events. Uh, we have a ton of stuff going on, like Lauren mentioned. Every week we host a nature story time for kids on Fridays at 10 a.m. Every other week we house, host outdoor trivia on Thursday nights at seven. And in addition, next week we have an outdoor adventure moth style storytelling night on Tuesday. Thursday we have iNaturalist and Northeast Alpine Flower Watch citizen science training. And Friday night is Hiking 101. So thank you again for coming. Um, hope everyone uh, stays healthy and safe and uh, has a great year. All thank right. you. Good job, John. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. John, I'm going to hang out because I like seeing the number dwindle a little bit. Thank you, Tom and Talita and Niels. Oh, look at this. Niels, we're hanging out again. How do I exhale? Um, <laughs> Talita, that was great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Here's Mala. She's been sleeping this whole time. There you go. Uh, good. Aww. Come here. All right. Bye bye. Bye. She did 50 miles. There you go. You don't, you, you've only got 220 left then. You got it. High five. <laughs> you could be an end to end panelist in no time at all. By the end of the summer. There you go. Yeah. Um, how are you all doing? Good. How are you? Pretty good. This was great. This went really well. Yeah, I thought it, I thought it went great. Yeah. Um, it's always tough to think about putting everything online, but that was nice. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely like the format and I thought the polls were cool too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Um, hey, John. I'm talking to Neil. <laughs> Everyone else left besides the 21 attendees that are listening to Neil's and I talk. <laughs> but yeah, I'll talk to you later. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye everyone else that's hanging on. I'm going to kick you off.